Well, good morning. morning. We are glad that you're here. Uh, Tim said it was a privilege to gather in the house of the Lord. But it's a privilege for me to stand behind this pulpit and to share this morning. Uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see the young people grow up in the church. Uh, I have enjoyed taking orders from Abe. Uh, it's wonderful. I love it. I love it. Watched him grow up as a little boy, and now to look to him and say, is it my turn? Is it my turn? Uh, but thank you, Abe, for your work here and, and, uh, and all the rest of you. Some of you, of course, have, have prayed for me during some health issues. Uh, a year ago uh, now, I was getting kind of psyched up and prayed up to start radiation treatments. Went through 33 radiation treatments at our hospital. And uh, the first week of December, I finished those. And they said, you'll, uh, you'll be tired and you'll be, and I, I can vote for all the, the above. Uh, but eventually they said, you'll, you'll find yourself getting, getting energized and feeling better. And, uh, and I'm grateful for that because that's exactly what has happened. Uh, I feel pretty good. Uh, my wife and I have, uh, have spent most of the summer, as you know, at our little cottage up north and uh, enjoyed that time away. I wasn't sure what to wear this morning. Uh, no disrespect for those who are a little casual. But uh, I said to Carol, what am I going to wear? Uh, do I wear a pair of shorts and t-shirt or, or, or what? And she said, wear what you're comfortable in. So this is what I've got, OK? Uh, I, I said to somebody this morning, I was afraid if I didn't have this on, no one would recognize who I was. <laughs> uh, well, uh, anyway, we are delighted to be here and to, to share. Uh, uh, the lady that I want to talk to you a little bit about, she had gone down in history as America's greatest miser. One time she was called the Witch of Wall Street. Yet she, she died in 1916. Hetty Green le left an, an, an estimated value at that time of $100 million. That, that's, that's Hetty. Go back to the first one, and, uh, Andy, would you please? That's her paying her taxes. Can you see how excited she is? <laughs> Doesn't she look just like a ball of energy? <laughs> Not really. But uh, and then the next one is is the way she really looked, and she walked around in kind of black uh, uh, cl uh, clothing most of the time. The the witch of Wall Street made her money in real estate and railroads and. She ate cold oatmeal because it would cost her to heat it. Uh, her son had to suffer a leg amputation because she delayed so long in looking for a free clinic that would do surgery until it was beyond incurable. She was wealthy yet lived uh, a life like a pauper. Eccentric? Certainly. Crazy? Perhaps. No one could prove it. She was so foolish that she hastened her own death by having a stroke over a big argument about the value of drinking skim milk. <laughs> now, I can see that being an argument for some, but I'm not sure I would make it where it would, I'd end up losing my life. But Hedy Green is, a, is an illustration of, of too many Christian believers. They have limitless wealth because of their faith in Jesus. And yet they live sometimes like a pauper. Maybe not as miserly as Hetty. But it was this kind of a, a believer that Paul wrote the book to the Ephesians. If you read the book of Ephesians through, you will see bits and pieces where he tries to encourage them. Maybe we need to hear this prayer this morning that the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian church so we can find out a little bit how we can prevail. The verb prevail, you've likely heard it a dozen times through this series. That means to be more powerful than opposing forces, to be victorious, to, to be triumphant, 
uh, to win, and on and on. Now let's read Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you may grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. That's, that's us, by the way. Okay. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realm. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. Isn't that a great prayer? Uh, well, we're going to look at it and try to unpack it this morning if we can. Paul prays, first of all, for understanding and, and insight. Now, now we may ask the question, why does he pray that way? He starts talking and says, I, I don't quit praying for you. The Ephesian church, I keep praying for you constantly, he says. I pray for you. And I'm asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight. Now, I like the next two of the words. So that, this translation says, so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. One translation says, so that you may know him better. I, I pray, Paul says, to the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you'll grow in the knowledge of him. Albert Barnes, a great old, old uh, writer, wrote in a commentary uh, about the acknowledgement of God. That is... Barnes said, in order that you may more fully acknowledge him or know him more intimately or thoroughly. They had already, they were already believers. He talked about their, their strong faith and their love for believers everywhere. Paul felt that they might, might claim higher ground, another step above. How much farther can we go? Albert Barnes said, there is an unfathomed depth of knowledge which they may still explore and which they should be exhorted still to attempt to fathom. There's more. There's more. Like the athlete, a hockey player, or football player, or whatever, and the coach says, oh yeah, he's good. Yeah, Austin Matthews is, is good. Yeah, he's a great hockey player. But I think there's more. Ever heard coaches say that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think they can get to the, to, to the next level. Uh, I, I think they can give more. Do, do, we ever, do we ever think that about ourselves and our spiritual walk with Jesus? Is there more? Is there more? Can we get to another level? Can we get to know God more intimately? More thoroughly? Maybe we can. Maybe this prayer is for us. These believers were, were strong in their faith. They, they had love for all the believers everywhere. Paul prayed that they would have spiritual wisdom, understanding, so that they would grow in the knowledge of God. Is there another level in the knowledge of God? Barnes said it's, so, it's, it's fathomless. You, can't, you can never get to the end. John Kelvin, the old writer, said, For nothing is more dangerous than to be satisfied with a measure of spiritual benefits which has been already obtained, whatever 
then maybe the height of our attainments, let them be always accompanied by the desire of something higher. It's dangerous to step back on our laurels and say, well, I, I, I'm there, I've arrived. Calvin says, no, 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 it's dangerous for that. He goes, went on to say, the knowledge of the godly is never so pure, but that some dimness or obscurity hangs over the spiritual vision. You ever think that? There's sometimes that you, you gain some ground in your spiritual walk with Jesus. That may be in your devotional life. But there's some areas that you've gained some great grounds, and next thing you know, a few months later, it's, it's dim. It's not quite as bright as it was. Paul knows the more they knew of Jesus, the more they could prevail. I think that's true. Uh, ask anyone who's been walking with the Lord, walking this road. The more they understand, the more they learn, the more insight, the more of grace they know, the better they will prevail. I, I think you can ask anybody who's been walking with the Lord. In fact, let's see if it bears out here at Bethany. Uh, Ray, Ray Holding, you don't stand that. We got a microphone coming for you, Ray. <laughs> I got I got three questions for you. How long have you been walking with the Lord? Not all my life, because I knelt at my mother's knee when I was age five, five or six. That's about seventy-two years ago, and. I had a renewal in 1961 with the uh, Barry Moore crusade here in town. And uh, I came back in full force to the Lord. Amen. Has, has God been faithful to you? Yes. Um, I have an advocate with the Father. Amen. And it's the Holy Spirit. Amen. Or would you ever turn back? No. No? No, I am. You, you've made your decision, you're going ahead? I am, yes, I All right. am. Yes. All right. Oh, Wayburn, where are you at? Oh, Wayburn's over there. Andrea, uh, let, let's ask Wayburn Snyder. Uh, let's see if this bears out here as the longer we walk with the Lord. Wayburn, how long you walk with the Lord? Oh, uh, since I was 19. Since you were 19? Yes, that's uh, 56 years. 56 years. Yes. Has God been faithful to you? Yes, always has been. Would you ever turn your back and walk away? Well, you know, when you phoned the other day and asked me, you were going to ask this question. <laughs> As I was reading this morning, Paul told Timothy, continue in the things that you have learned and be faithful. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's get a lady. Where's Joyce Stewart at? Joyce, right back in the back. Andrea, uh, uh, talk to Joyce. Uh, I've got a couple questions to ask for Joyce. Uh, Joyce, how long have you been walking with the Lord? Well, I made a public confession of my faith in Christ at a Lighten Ford Crusade in the arena in Chatham, Ontario, as a teenager. So it's been well over 50 years. Has God been faithful to you? Day by day. And the neat thing is, we know God's faithfulness even when we're not totally aware of it. Would you ever walk away? Absolutely not. I'm Absolutely not. In his faithfulness. Amen. Alice, swing up here, over here. Andrea? Some questions for you, Alice. Just the same three. How long have you walked with the Lord? Many years. <laughs> <laughs> if I never taught you, don't ask a woman her age. That's right, that's right. That's right. Has God been faithful to you? Amen, brother. Would you ever walk away? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, Wayne Shield, just across the aisle. When, when I said, when I asked my wife, I said, I'm going to ask some long timers. She said, don't call them. I'm going to ask some old timers. She said, don't call them old timers, call them long timers. 
So here's another long time. Wayne, how long have you walked with the Lord? 73 years. 73 years. Has God been faithful? He certainly has. I may just say, after I committed my life to the Lord and took him as my Savior 73 years ago, I felt the need the next year to make him a, crown him as Lord of my life. Amen. And I went to an altar of prayer the next year and said, Lord, take it all. Take it all. Amen. And that's held through right today. Now, just to give you an update on how the Lord is faithful, this has been a horrendous week for Ruth and me. It started out last Friday with a celebration of our family get-together, celebrating our 65th wedding anniversary. Saturday, we had that deluge of rain. I've never seen rain come down like it did and formed a little lake behind our house. Came into our house, flooded the basement, and uh, what a week we've had. Uh, Has God been faithful through it all, Wayne? Oh, just to let you know how faithful he's been, the first responders were there within uh, hours to make an assessment of the damage. And uh, I was just amazed, I was absolutely amazed at how willing they wanted to do what they had to do. They were there. And then the excavator came on Thursday night to dig a ditch behind the house so it wouldn't happen again. And wouldn't you know, he cut the power line to our phone. <laughs> well, now what? Well, Ruth and I went out on Friday morning for our annual, our, our regular morning coffee. And out of the blue, Ruth said, there's a Bell telephone guy. And I went over to him and I said, we've got a problem. I said, excavators were at our place last night and severed the line. He said, well, I'm just finishing my breakfast right now. He said, I have time. He said, uh, I was called to do a repair out here in New Hamburg and it was for Rogers, not for Bell. So he said, here I am, I've got time. I'm a Bell customer. He said, I'll be right over. In a few minutes, he had everything going and I was just amazed indeed. And I said, you are a godsend. And it reminded me of that scripture in Hebrews 12 verse one, are not angels ministering spirits? And I just felt he was God's angel, that he was there right when we needed him. So God is faithful. Would you, would you ever turn back and walk no, away? The, no way. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you to all you five. And I'm pretty sure, yeah, I do that. I'm sure we could have went to, to many more. And they would have said the same thing. It's something about the knowledge. The more we know about God and his grace, the less chance we are to walk away. For me, it's 58 years. 58 years. Has God been faithful? Oh, my, my, my. Has God been good? Grant Eby used to come to our church in Elmira when I pastored. And back then, of course, pastors always sit at the door and shake hands with all their people going out. And Grant Eby used to go out, and I said, Grant, how are you doing today? And he said, better than I deserve. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. And I could say that again and again and again. Has God been faithful? Better than I deserve. And I'm not about to walk away. No turning back, the old hymn said, the old chorus sang. Uh, no turning back. I've decided to follow Jesus. Once we get to know him, and Paul says, praying to this Ephesian church, I pray. In fact, he said constantly, I pray that you will get something of the knowledge of God. You will get to know him more intimately. You know, I thought this morning, and I prayed this this morning. What a, what a wonderful prayer to pray for our kids. Lord Jesus, I pray for Trevor and Ann, Philip and Sarah. Lord, that you, by your glorious Holy Spirit, would reveal yourself to them again and again and again. Increase their knowledge of God. I pray for Finley and, and Nate. Lord, that they would understand the knowledge of God and get to know you better. 
Hey, man, wouldn't that be a great prayer to pray to pray for your kids, your grandkids every morning? Paul's prayed it to the, this church that were faithful and that loved all the believers. And he prayed that they would have more. Well, the second one. He, he, he prays that their hearts would be flooded. And here's the little word, so that, again. They would be flooded so that they're that you can understand the confident hope he has given those he called his holy people who are rich and glorious inheritance for more light, more light to be given so they would understand the hope that is theirs. The New Living Translation says, so that you can understand the wonderful future he has promised those he's called. Maybe the Ephesian church needed the first prayer that they would have understanding so they could grasp the second one, that the light would show them their future. May we never lose sight of the wonderful future. When, when our beloved Linda Curl, who was secretary here all the years I was here, and uh, getting toward the end as I would visit her, she'd say, I'm not afraid of dying. I know exactly where I'm going. I'm not afraid of dying. Well, I'm scared to death of the process. Isn't that the truth for all of us? My brother, many of you prayed for my brother Lloyd that was in the hospital. We were down this week on Tuesday and, and then in his kitchen, him and his wife's kitchen, Carol made a beautiful fish, fish supper. And the Lloyd loved fish. But one day he was in the hospital on a very dark day. His daughter called me and said, Uncle Bill, would you, would you call Dad today? He's in London Hospital in ICU and He's in a very dark place. And I said, sure. I called my brother and got through to the ICU and chatted with him. He was weak. And uh, I said, how are you doing? And, and hesitatingly, he said, not very good. Not very good. And I prayed for him on the phone. And as I prayed, his voice started getting stronger. And I said, you, you, you sound stronger now than we were when I first called you. He said, that's because of prayer. And it was after I talked to him. He said, during a very dark time, he said, I didn't think I was going to make it. He said, I had this, this thought or this vision. He said, it was a, a huge black mountain. And I was halfway up or halfway down this, this, this mountain. He said, I thought I was going to die. He said, but at the bottom of the mountain, white letters, as big as I could imagine at the bo bottom, spelled out L-I-V-E. He said, I knew I was going to make it. I knew I was going to make it. And he's getting stronger all the time. He's got a new walker. He walks around the house, and he, he ran a little bit with it. scared us to death the other day. What does, a, what does a hope look like for us? Hope and inheritance in Christ. And one translation says in Colossians 1, 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Because the hope laid up for you in it, because the hope laid up for you in heaven. Hope and inheritance in Christ. That's, that's our future. Heard of a town in Maine, the state of Maine. And... Uh, they are going to put a big power dam in. And so in that valley, where all the houses, where all the people live, they were going to build a big power dam, and the whole town would be submerged underwater. I don't know how long they gave them, um, months or a few years to, to get their affairs in order and, and move out, find another place to live. Uh, but during that time, they were getting ready to leave, something curious happened. And it, that is, everybody gave up as far as painting their house, doing any repairs to the sidewalk. Nothing happened to the road. And somebody said, why, why does the town look so poor? And one citizen said this, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. What's the use of painting? It's going to be gone in a way. What's the use of fixing the sidewalk? It's not going to be here in a way. 
with all that's transpiring in our world today, with pandemic and wars and rumors of wars, can I, can I ask you today? Listen, listen. <laughs> listen. Don't forget your future. If, if, if we forget the hope that's before us, if we forget the inheritance that's ours, we too will have very little power to live in the present. Let's not lose sight. Let's not lose sight of what's before us. And Paul says to these Ephesian church that we're faithful and that love the brethren. Paul says to those, don't you ever lose sight of the future. I pray that your eyes will be so enlightened that you will be flooded to the, to the fact that you'll understand there's a hope for us. There's a future for us. It's not in the economy. It's not in the political system. But it's in the kingdom of God. A wonderful hope. Paul's concerned that they don't lose hope. Paul says he prays that they will be enlightened. There's a song that says, I'm not afraid of it, not ashamed of the gospel. Uh, Janet Pascoe sings that in one of those videos from Bill Gaither's. Uh, she sings this, For every moment his hand has held mercy. For all the love he has shown all my life. A simple thank you doesn't say how I'm feeling. I get tears in my eyes. So as for me, I'm going to keep on believing. And the one who's been so faithful to me, I'm not out to please the whole world around me. I've got my mind on eternity. Part of the chorus is, I've got too much behind me to let this world bind me. To some he's a name, but to me he's my everything. So Paul prays for hope. Hope in the inheritance. May we never lose sight. A rich and glorious inheritance he's given. They were not misers. Not, not, no, no heady green here. They're rich due to the inheritance. The will, the will was set. You hear about the old guy that got new hearing aids? And uh, somebody said to him, how's the new hearing aids work? Oh, he said, they're incredible, incredible. He said, I was sitting in my family the other day. He said, have you told them? No, he said, I haven't told them. But I've changed my will three times. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know the will is set. The will is already set. Jesus has already signed the document. The inheritance is sure. The hope is sure. And, and Paul told the Ephesian church, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't lose sight. And can I say to those that may be watching today, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, now is the time to say, yes, Lord Jesus, I need you. I, I receive you. I, 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 I confess my sin, and I receive you as my Savior. Don't miss out on the hope. And then number three, Paul prays that they will know the greatness of God. Incredible greatness of God. Exceeding, exceeding greatness of God. Once you experience the greatness, the incredible greatness is for us, Paul prayed. Paul talks about the kind that raises the dead. The kind that raised Jesus from the dead. One translation says exceeding, another extravagant, another incredible, another immeasurable, another transcendent. There's an old, old Britisher, a pure English Puritan, lived back in the early 1600s. And he talked about what is exceeding. And listen to the way he describes it. Here is a most emphatic heap of most divine and significant words to express that which can never sufficiently be conceived or uttered. Who talks like that? Imagine. Here's the most emphatic heap of most divine and significant words to express that which can never sufficiently be conceived or uttered. How do you describe the greatness of God? He said, it's beyond me. I can't do it. I, I can't begin to describe you the, the greatness of God. John MacArthur said, Paul, therefore, did not pray that God's power be given to the believers, but that they are aware of the power they already possessed in Christ. Not misers. We don't need to be paupers. 
We're children of God. When a, when a, when a Christian plugs in to God's energy source, what, what do they get? What kind of power? A source that can raise the dead. And then this benediction that Paul prays partway through the book. He says in Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more. Pastor Anthony would say, say it with me together. Immeasurably more. One more time. Immeasurably more. Than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that has worked where? Within us. Say it together. Within us. To him be glory to the church. And in Christ Jesus through all generations. Forever and ever. Isaiah 54, 7 says, No weapon forced against you will prevail. There's that word. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. And listen to the look at the last line. This is the heritage of the servants of God. This is our heritage. Paul told the Ephesians that he was praying for understanding so that they would know him better. He prayed that they would be given more light so that they could who would not forget the hope of their inheritance. And he prayed that they would know the greatness of God. What a prayer. What a prayer. At, at our little cottage, we don't have a TV. Well, we've got a TV, but we don't get any stations. Uh, it's not very funny. We, uh, we just stand and look at it. Like the lady that was in Best Buy wanted to buy a TV and they wouldn't sell it to her and they found out why. She finally said, why won't you sell it to me? He said, because that's the, that's the stove you're looking at. <laughs> right there, I want to say she must have been a blonde, but I won't say that. <laughs> but I do watch a lot of videos at the cottage. I think I've bought pretty well every homecoming gathering video at thrift stores for about 25 cents a piece. And we watch a lot of those. I watched one a while ago, an old one. When Danny Gaither, Bill Gaither's brother, was still alive. And, and it was wonderful. We watched it. In the middle, Bill Gaither had an interview with his brother Danny. And he said, Danny, how you doing? We know you've had cancer just want you to talk to the people and let them know how you're doing. And Danny said these words. He said, you know, Bill, he said, I've had a tough time. He said, a while ago, he said, I was, after chemo, he said, I was in the hospital in isolation. And my wife had been in and to see me and then back to the motel, as close as she could get to him back then, back to the motel. And he said, I laid there that night, and he said, I couldn't sleep. And he said, I, uh, I didn't know what to do. I wasn't feeling well. I couldn't sleep. He said, and then he said, I thought of that little, little poem, Mom, little song Mom used to sing to us before we went to bed when we were just little kids. Five little angels around my bed, one at the foot and one at the head, one to sing, the one to pray. I want to take my sin away. Sometimes it's the fear away. How do, we, how do we make it today? How do we, as people of God, prevail? I'll tell you. We, we prevail when we understand the knowledge of God more intimately. We prevail when he gives more light that renews our hope for the future. We prevail when we know something of the greatness of God and five, five old angels.